Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, it is my privilege to have a good friend, a successful entrepreneur, and a fellow IPO with me, Justin Taylor. Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ashutosh. Uh, Justin is the founder of Care Private Limited, which is the largest and fastest growing ACAS company. That's air conditioning as a service. It's the first company to sell air. Justin is also the group CEO of Care based at the headquarters in Singapore. So Justin, tell me a little bit about what would, be, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or career? Oh, okay. If I go back in time, Ashutosh, to when I was at university, I studied commerce and mm -hmm. I studied law. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end of those two degrees, I had a choice. Would I go into, for example, the traditional account? I mean, it was very oriented straight towards a career. Right. So would I go into accounting or would I go into law? And I chose law. Yeah. Uh, no regrets. Started as a young article clerk at the absolute bottom of the rung. Mm -hmm. And at that time, imagined that I'd be a lawyer for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I did my master's, progressed through the firm and became a partner at quite a young age, okay. all of which was exhilarating and, and enjoyable. And I was learning a lot. But I got to a point, I was only 27, because uh, I'd started university when I was young. And I started to feel that there was more to the world. I didn't know what it was. I, I can't pretend to tell you that I had a clear vision or a goal or whatever. Oh. I just had a I felt it started to feel a bit unfulfilled mm -hmm. and I thought there might be more out there. I didn't know what, and I wanted to go and see. Mm -hmm. So I quit being a lawyer and I bought a ticket to Europe. The funny thing is I didn't get to Europe. I only got as far as Singapore okay. uh, where I caught up with, I caught up with some, with a girl who I'd met and who I knew. Mm -hmm. And then that started the next stage of my journey. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then what happened, uh, you know, uh, once you reached Singapore, how did you start working on, and building care? Uh, so the, the funny thing was when I came to Singapore, I suddenly was exposed to so many people doing so many different things in business that weren't a traditional career. I mean, you, you certainly had your accountants and your lawyers and your architects and your engineers, etc. But there were just so many people doing entrepreneurial things. And I was, you know, I suppose I was very naive and underexposed. And I just used to meet people and talk to them and listen. And I would think, wow, that's a business. Mm -hmm. And people do that, and that's all you do. And and I think it just it opened my eyes to, you know, as a lawyer, I'd always felt you were in the grandstand watching the game. Mm -hmm. Getting into business allowed you to go on the field. Okay. So I suppose that that really was the beginning of the the next milestone, which was starting a business around air conditioning mm -hmm. and getting involved in that. I think when when you ask me about milestones, I think the, the big one then that would have followed would have been we sold. I became involved in my wife's family business mm -hmm. and they were traditionally involved in air conditioning distribution uh, throughout Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and had done very, very well in it from the 1950s uh, mm -hmm. forward. But they'd had a couple of iterations. They'd, they'd represented a, you know, the brand of carrier air conditioning, which they took into India in 1986 for the first yep. time. Mm -hmm. um, they'd sold that business back to carrier. They then started again with another brand called Train, which was part of American Standard. Mm -hmm. Did that for 10 to 12 years, and eventually that was sold back to the, to the principal. Mm -hmm. And then there was one more dance with, with the Japanese brand Daikin. All of them slightly different products and slightly mm -hmm. different markets. Mm -hmm. But I was by the time I'd become the CEO of the group, we were at a stage where we had the opportunity to sell that business back to Daikin again, mm -hmm. uh, which I did. And then we had, believe it or not, we still had other brands come towards us and say, would we represent them and do that journey again? Mm. And I think the big milestone for, for me and, and for the family was to sit down and say, no, actually, we've got to a point in our path where we, that has been very rewarding and we've, we've had some success in it, but we saw that the landscape had changed. And I think in one sense, that was a major decision not to do something as opposed to do something. Okay. That then would lead to, I think, the third milestone would be when we started this brand new business model of selling air, mm -hmm. which came a few years after we decided not to continue in that path of, um, of representing air conditioning companies. And I should twist, that was the beginning of when we, when we started to sell air, I think it was the beginning of us becoming 
funnily enough, a software company as opposed to a hardware company. Yeah. We'd spent 60 or 70 years representing engineering products, air conditioning products, mm -hmm. and that was really about great equipment and, and, and applying it in a way that helped people and it was reliable and safe and, and very performance-driven. Mm -hmm. But when we moved to air as a service and you integrate those sort of systems, the software just became so important and getting data. And so that was a significant milestone, shifting from, from, from hardware to software. And really today, I think we're a, we're a data company. Okay. So tell me about Care Air. I mean, what are you doing when you say that you're supplying air as a service? Well, it's, it's easiest to maybe use some examples first. So when we, what we saw, Ashutosh, was so many people were starting to move towards wanting access and the use of the outputs from assets rather than ownership of the assets. Mm -hmm. So if we look at companies like Grab here in Southeast Asia or Uber in the, in the, in the West, People want a mobility rather than necessarily having ownership of a car. Correct. I look at people like, uh, you know, the great example of Rolls-Royce mm. who sold thrust rather than the engines and they allowed airlines to pay, they paid per mile rather than buying the engines. And we saw, you know, air conditioning systems were becoming in some ways increasingly complicated because the challenge of dealing with the climate for different applications in, in mm. commerce, whether it's manufacturing or industrial or just straight commercial or education, mm. They were there, but also the issues of sustainability. So how can, we, how can we have the environment we want inside and not be harming the environment outside? And we saw that, or we thought, that we could put a stake in the ground and try and move the business to an area where we said, well, people don't really want to own air conditioning assets. Mm -hmm. we're, we're a bit of an unusual family. We'd spent all this time owning or representing these assets, and we loved them, we talked about them, we got excited about them. Mm -hmm. But there weren't many people like that. Mm -hmm. um, what people were excited about is what use they could put the outputs to okay. in their business. They create experiences. Mm. So we saw an opportunity to say, well, why don't we give you the air you want, the climate you want, with all of the characteristics you want in terms of health and temperature and humidity and quality and sustainability. And you use that to create the experience that's your forte. Mm. Let us create the air, which is our forte. And so we set up the business model, which essentially allows us to, we own all of the assets and we sell the output. Mm. So you buy air mm. like you buy power or like you buy water. Mm. Um, but we focus very much on, on how we can create a part of the experience, which is the climate inside a, a building or a facility, mm. so, that our, so that our customers and partners can create the product or the experience they're trying to deliver. And, you know, given the kind of pollution that is there in, in several countries, certainly in my country, I mean, you know, selling good quality air should be a big business here. So maybe we'll see you back in India. Yeah, well, we've, we've, I'm very pleased to announce we, we, with our partner in India, we've opened a 35-acre site in Pune. And it's a, it's a wonderful site and it's a fantastic project, Ashutosh, because to me, it, it, it sort of represents the whole opportunity in India in 35 acres, which, mm. the, and I say that because at one end of the 35 acres, we have very high-end manufacturing for mm. the automotive industry, you know, semi-clean room, high-end precision manufacturing you have um and very and very focused on clean and mm -hmm. green mm -hmm. then you have education campus within the 35 acres mm -hmm. educating i think it's about four thousand students in this school it's a massive school by singapore standards i don't know that it's that big by by indian standards mm -hmm. then you have residential residential then you have commercial and retail and lifestyle mm -hmm. so as you move from one end of the park to the other it's it's got all of these things in India that are really starting to boom. It, we were driven by there was a sustainability issue, but there was also an access to power issue. So there were limitations on power and water. So how could we create more and create these environments without using so much power and water? Mm -hmm. So we've tapped solar there. So it's a sustainable site. It's, it looks after itself. And you can really give people what they want and you can give it to them at a very economic rate. So it's been a really exciting opportunity. The other thing that I love about India is meeting then all of the young engineers. I mean, you, you've got a country that's so vibrant and so focused on technology and they ask questions which really support our model, which is, well, I don't want to do things that are not my core. Mm. How can I focus on what my core is and access other services? So doing things differently, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes just because of their drive. It's been a great opportunity for us. And, and having, proven, having proven what we can do here in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty tough environment to operate in. I mean, you've really got to, you've, 
you know, you don't get rewarded unless you deserve it in Singapore. You've got to deliver value and you've got to be different. But to take those performance characteristics to a country that's moving and growing like India is, is really exciting. Fantastic. Wonderful. So, you know, my next question is that you must be hiring hundreds of people. What do you look for when you hire someone? I tend to keep it very simple at the start and hopefully I can keep it simple all the way through to the end. I, I always say to myself or I tell people I should push. For me, there's, there's a, a few certain things on the page that you have to tick off before the person even warrants the rest of the discussion. Mm. And obviously there's attitude, integrity. I have a huge bias if people are trying to win me over. People who bring energy and enthusiasm. Correct. You know, you want, we want people who are going to add to the environment. You want people who are going to give. You don't want people who are just going to come in and take. So people are going to be net contributors to what you do. It doesn't mean they're all the same. It doesn't mean they're extroverts. They can be introverts. But people who, who in their nature, and you can tell they want to make a difference and they want to contribute. Mm -hmm. So they're always very important characteristics to me. And they're, they're displayed by you know, showing up on time, the way people participate, those sorts of things. Then I move to, you know, I always ask myself, can they do the job? Mm -hmm. And that's either because they've done it before. Uh, they haven't done it before, but they're on a trajectory that shows that they should be able to okay. with some help and some coaching and some opportunity. Mm -hmm. The second thing I, we always ask ourselves is, will they do it? Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes being able to do it and being motivated in, 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 in our environment to do it is, is a different thing. Okay. And the last thing is for us is, will they fit in? Okay. Will they fit in with, with our culture? And as I say, that doesn't mean we're looking for everyone to be the same, but in terms of our values and the way we work and the way we'd like to do things, will they fit in? And can they work with pe with their peers, particularly leaders? I want to see leaders who are interested in the development of others, not themselves. Okay. So very giving in that style of leadership and looking to nurture and coach and develop. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're some of the simple things I use. We always tend to complicate it later. but. I so we all That's do. how I start. We all do. But that gives <laughs> and me... I, I can tell you I've got, I've got a very, I learned a lot because I had a very patchy record of success at the outset. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you, yeah. you don't ever get perfect at it, but you can't be scared to continue to do it. Absolutely right. So therefore now that brings me to the converse of that section, you know, you run so many businesses, you must got multiple CEOs. If you're hiring right, which you say you are, what are the qualities a good CEO should have? You know, I, I think for me, what I, what I tend to look for is what I've seen, what I've, what I've worked for and with and who I've had. And, you know, we'll talk about YPO later, but one of the mm. great things that I've taken from YPO that it has given me yep. is the ability to watch so many different CEOs in action right. and so many different styles and characters, the diversity of their backgrounds and their businesses. But to look at the way they do things, and that's just been a like a living education. For me, I think fundamentally you have to be yourself and recognise that there's going to be some parts of your makeup that are probably your strengths that are going to be really helpful mm -hmm. and there's going to be other parts of your natural inclination and your makeup that aren't going to be so helpful. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you tap into some, mm -hmm. try and refine others, but probably more honestly as you dampen them down mm -hmm. and then try and always add more tools to the toolbox. Okay. But I think importantly, it always has to be in the context of you being yourself. And that doesn't mean that you're good enough as you are. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be a learner. As I say, you have to be adding to your toolbox, but you just have to recognise what's right in any particular circumstances. I think there's, a, there's those who see, you know, for me, a CEO is you try and win the day. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes we go to bed at night and you think, wow, I did really well today. I saw... I lit up the eyes of the people I was with, my team mm. or my customers. You know, they've inspired, they've done well. I couldn't be prouder of them. Mm. And there's other days where often I don't feel like I've done as well as I could have. And you, you know, you just think, but you've got to, but when you have the great day, mm. it doesn't change the challenge the next day. And I think that's something that probably doesn't get either explained to us or taught to us at the beginning that, you know, I, I think the greatest harm is if you, when you think you're cruising. I've never really had that sensation and it would alarm me if I did because I think it's always a continuous journey and it's a continuous battle. What a fabulous answer. What a fabulous answer. So let's now move to YPO, you know, mm -hmm. an organization that you and I both love very much. You know, you've reached exalted positions in the organization. 
and uh, also i think you and i both uh, started in the singapore chapter i mean i moved back oh, to it, yeah. yeah therefore that that bond also exists my question is when did you join ypo i joined when i was i joined in 2001 okay so i was 34 years old and i'll tell you i was petrified uh-huh i really and i and i joined i joined in ignorance okay. uh, if i'm very honest and, I, and you know i did, i was pushed into it by my father-in-law who said this will help you trust me mm-hmm. and i did trust him so i joined and i don't think you could have explained to me really what it was i think it's one of those things certainly in those days you had to get in an experience to it to appreciate it and the more i experienced it the uh you know the more the more i came to value it and i i still like today when you meet new members or young members to explain to them that you know we've all been in that position of being the new person mm. we've all felt awkward at the outset and unsure and whatever but i think one of the wonderful things is that i always benefited from so many people caring about helping you find your feet Correct. and being willing to share and help and so it 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 moved from being an uncomfortable awkward beginning to feeling comfortable very quickly mm. and you know i have two more questions on ypo or maybe three sure you have held all the leadership positions in the chapter and the region but you were also the vice chair of ypo international isn't it mm my question to you is yes, that on the board what 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 made you give back so much to an organization that uh, every one of the members loves so much i think for me i should to shut and know it it wasn't a plan it just happened i do think if i'm going to be involved in something i want to participate i don't see the benefit of just being in something for the for the sake of being in it and i found that my peer the more you participated the more you got out of it really i think also by participating you enrich the experience of others not because i am unique or anything like that it's just mm-hmm. that the more diversity and more voices and more people in the room mm-hmm. it helps the conversation it helps the education and the learning so i was getting a lot out of it and i i always felt for me it was a little bit of a you know being a family business we didn't i didn't go and do a business mba we didn't do a lot of formal executive education ypo for me was an ongoing business education so in serving in roles as i said i got exposure to leaders from many different parts of the world and many different businesses and um, sometimes being led by them sometimes having to lead them which can be very daunting you know at times yep. but great learning experiences and i always felt that the thing that kept me going was i always felt i went back to the business and to my family even a better leader okay. and a better person okay. so i i really thought i really valued what i got out of it uh, i hope i made a contribution of difference as well but for me it was a, it was a really enriching learning or has been a very and still is a very enriching learning experience i agree, I agree. and one last question for white on one yp sure you know, thousands of people will hear you and me speak and i'm sure there'll be many people who will be interested in yp yeah. why should a young ceo consider joining yp i think i think for the learning for the learning and the support it's a unique environment i believe you know i always you can join a chamber of commerce or you can join an industry association and these sorts of organizations but in many ways i think i should touch when people are in those they're wearing their mask as well which is they have a certain persona they have to project as a ceo and on behalf of their business mm-hmm. is not necessarily an environment which promotes vulnerability or can someone help me i just don't know what to do mm-hmm. in ypo you you very quickly learn that there's not many new problems sometimes they have different zeros attached to them or okay. they seem to have a different magnitude or they're always seemingly more dramatic because they're yours but whether it's with with people or with partners or with opening new businesses or closing businesses or starting to you have people willing to share with you their experience mm-hmm. and you learn so much from them and they tell you what they did right and what they tell you they did wrong and what they would do in hindsight again mm-hmm. and what they learned and it's not it's not in a way of preaching it's in a way of sharing and when people are only interested they don't have an agenda other than to help you understand their experiences in a way that might help you with whatever you're going through okay. uh, and i think that's very unique very unique it's a mm-hmm. it's an ability to tap into experience and wisdom with thought and with ca- and it's made available with thought and with care mm-hmm. and i don't think that exists in many organizations mm-hmm. certainly for me it was an environment that made me it made me feel very comfortable mm-hmm. you know i felt very you sit you sit in the international board and you say look i have no idea how to handle this mm-hmm. what are we doing mm-hmm. and you you watch people 
open up and share. And you, it, it's a fantastic environment for learning. And I think that exists in the chapters, in, in each of the, uh, the countries in which we are. It happens in the regions. It's all over. Absolutely. Well said. So I have time for a few questions for you personally. My sure. first question is, after such an amazing journey as a businessman... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's so amazing. <laughs> well, you know, you it's been a did journey. so many businesses, sold so many businesses. My question to you is, Justin, what does success mean to you? Uh, it's, okay, I'll answer that for you, Ashutosh, but I will also say, do you know what I think? Um, uh -huh. Having been in this business now for 25 years, I still feel like we're a 25-year startup. I, I would always love to have the ability to say, you know, imagine if I went back just three or four years knowing what I know now. Mm. We do so much differently. Okay. You know what really, what makes me feel really good at the, at the end of the day or at the end of a project or mm -hmm. in a period of time is when I see, when I can step back and I can see what people who are working with us achieve. Mm. And, you know, you can say, you know, the, I suppose the way I operate generally is I'd like to be in the background anyway because mm -hmm. I, I want them out doing things. But where you can say, look, you know what, they're fully equipped to handle that now and to move forward with even bigger challenges. Okay. I can fade backwards and I can go and help in another area. Mm. Um, that's success for me where people, where people step up and achieve more than they could have imagined, mm -hmm. where they had to perhaps be pushed, sometimes cajoled, sometimes really pushed. But with support, they, they do more than they thought they could. And as a group, you achieve more than you thought you could. Okay. And I really love pulling those groups together. Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing what we can achieve as a group. That, for me, that gives me great pleasure to nice. step back and enjoy that. But as I say, then you wake up the next day and you say, right, now we've got to move on to the next one. Wonderful. So a follow-up question to that is that, you know, you just said 25 years working, yet you keep looking back and saying, I wish, you know, it, so much more could have happened. Where do you draw your inspiration yeah. from? I, you know, for me, inspiration, can I translate or... or change inspiration for energy. I really get energy from people, okay. people inside our company, people from outside our company, uh, you know, from friends, but a lot from a lot of colleagues in YPO. I look at those leaders. I love listening to people mm. tell stories mm. about what they're doing. And, you know, I'm very, uh, sometimes I'm overly curious and I, I run the risk of being, I'm falling back into my legal career and being an interrogator. Mm. Okay. But I love, I love hearing why people are doing things and why do they see it that way and what made them make that choice and okay. were they scared and what worked out and what didn't. And mm. so I get inspired by you know, people who just have the courage to keep moving forward like that. And I, I love listening to them and it sends me back. You know, I often come back thinking, oh, my God, you know, I've got so much more to do and, and they're <laughs> so much stronger and better and more focused than me. So you just give yourself a little bit of a you get up the next day and you go again. Okay, well said. So my last question to you, you. and I come back to the sure. pandemic. So the, what, sorry? the pandemic that we are all faced with around the world. How are you yeah. rethinking your life in a new world order? I suppose there's been, uh, you know, personally, there's been obviously more face-to-face -face time with family because there's been no travel and there's been working from home. And we've still got, we still had a couple of kids at the outset of this who were in school, so there was more time with each other, mm -hmm. which actually was was a unique a unique opportunity. And we were very fortunate; we were we were healthy, and we had a you know the home environment allowed us to mm -hmm. to enjoy each other's company without standing on each other's toes too much. Mm -hmm. For me, it's been a very interesting thing in terms of business. We sat down as a as a group in, in our, as our leadership team, and we asked ourselves. You know, I, I said to them, how would we like to be remembered at the end of this? Whenever this is over, whether this is one year or two years or three years, what would we like our people to look back and say about our leadership, whether it's our customers or our employees or our community? You know, do we want them to say that you made me feel safe? You showed me a way through. You looked after us. You know, if we did our bit, you would do your bit. Um, so I think it's made us, it's made us, very connected with our people. It's brought our, it's brought our company a lot closer together. I thought we were close anyway. It's brought us even closer together. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's really focused the challenge of being a leader. It hasn't necessarily made it harder. I don't think it's just made it more, it's almost more visceral. It was always, you know, a lot of the changes that are happening were already happening. You know, for, for me, they were revealed. I wasn't prescient enough to see them beforehand, but they were revealed. But it's, I also tend to think, Ashutosh, I don't, 
you know, I don't know that it's a new world order in this. I think it's always, the world's always changing. And I, I know we tend to find things more dramatic when we're living in them, but mm -hmm. it, it's always changing. So I just see, you know, I think we're not trying to get through this. We're just living and working. Correct. Well said. Justin, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and honor pleasure. speaking to you. And I wish you lots of success with Care Air. Well, thank you, Ashutosh. Thank you for having me on. Um, and always nice to see you and have a chat. Likewise. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.